In the previous lectures we discussed the cholinergic agonists. So, today we'll discuss the cholinergic antagonists. Cholinergic antagonists are those agents that bind to cholinergic receptors, muscarinic or nicotinic, and prevent the effects of acetylcholine and other cholinergic agonists. They are divided into three groups according to their sites of action. To clarify this let's use that illustration from the autonomic receptors lecture. The first group is the antimuscarinic agents, which are selective blockers of muscarinic receptors causing the effects of parasympathetic innervation to be interrupted. In addition, they block the few exceptional sympathetic neurons that are cholinergic, such as those innervating the salivary and sweat glands. They have little or no action at skeletal neuromuscular junctions or autonomic ganglia as they have nicotinic receptors. They are also known as anticholinergic agents or parasympathelytics. And they are the most clinically useful group of the cholinergic antagonists. The second group is the ganglionic blockers, these agents block the nicotinic receptors of the sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglia. Clinically, they are the least important of the cholinergic antagonists. The third group is the neuromuscular blocking agents, mostly nicotinic antagonists. They interfere with transmission of efferent impulses to skeletal muscles. Now let's discuss the antimuscarinic agents. The first one is atropine. It binds competitively and prevents acetylcholine from binding to muscarinic receptors. And this effect can be reversed by using acetylcholine esterase agent leading to accumulation of acetylcholine and increasing its effect. To discuss its actions we have to go back to autonomic receptors lecture, where we knew the effects of parasympathetic innervation on each muscarinic receptor, then reverse all we said then, as adrepine blocks these receptors. Now let's discuss adrepine actions, uses and its alternative and muscarinic drugs at the same time. Atropine blocks muscarinic activity in the eye resulting in midriasis, unresponsiveness to light, and cycloplegia which is the inability to focus for near vision. And intraocular pressure may rise especially in patients with closed angle glaucoma. So it can be used as an ophthalmic solution, and it is available with the brand name, isoptoatropine. But the problem that it has a very long duration of action for about 7 to 14 days. So it has been replaced by shorter acting ophthalmic solutions such as, cyclopentylate, which has about 24 hours duration of action. Tropicamide, which has about 6 hours duration of action. Atropine decreases the tone and motility of the GI tract but it does not affect the production of hydrochloric acid significantly, so it can't be used for peptic ulcers but can be used as an antispasmodic drug. But it is not the best, as the dose used to treat spasms also reduce saliva secretion, ocular accommodation, and urination. So it has been replaced by a more selective agent. Hyosinbutyl bromide, it is used as antispasmodic in case of intestinal, renal or biliary spasms. It is available with the brand name, Buscopan tablets and injection. Atropine also causes bronchodilatation and decreased bronchial secretions but it has been replaced by agents that are used as inhalation and does not have any systemic effects, such as, ibotropium and sheotropium, which are known commercially as, atrovent and spiriva, respectively. These agents are approved as bronchodilators for maintenance treatment of bronchospasm associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Apotropium is also used in the acute management of bronchospasm in asthma. Sheotropium is administered once daily, a major advantage over apotropium, which requires dosing up to four times daily. Atropine causes relaxation of detrezor muscle of urinary bladder, causing urine retention. So it can be used for overactive bladder. But it has been replaced by agents that are selective to muscarinic receptors in the bladder, such as, darifenosin, fisoterodine, oxybutynin, solifenosin tolterodine and trospium chloride, that are known commercially as, Enablex, Tovias, Ditropan, Vesicare, Ditrol, and Sanctura, respectively. But they still have some side effects including dry mouth, constipation, and blurred vision. Atropine increases the heart rate, known as tachycardia. 
so it can be used to treat bradycardia of varying etiologies. And it blocks muscarinic receptors in the salivary glands, producing dryness of the mouth. It also decreases secretions of sweat and lacrimal glands. Inhibition of secretions of sweat glands can elevate body temperature, which is dangerous especially in children. Atropine can also be used as antidote for cholinergic agonists in case of organophosphate, insecticides or nerve gases poisoning, and overdose of clinically used anticholinous erases such as physostigmine. It also can be used in treating central toxic effects of anticholinous erases as it can enter the CNS. Adverse effects of atropine depend on the dose, it may cause dry mouth, blurred vision, tachycardia, urine retention, and constipation. Effects on the CNS include restlessness, confusion, hallucinations, and delirium, which may progress to depression, collapse of the circulatory and respiratory systems, and death. Low doses of cholinesterase inhibitors, such as physostigmine, may be used as antidotetropine toxicity. Other antimuscarinic agents are scopolamine, produces effects similar to those of atropine but it has a greater action on the CNS and a longer duration of action as compared to atropine. It is one of the most effective anti-motion sickness drugs available. And it is available as a topical patch that provides effects for up to three days. Scopolamine is also used for post-operative nausea and vomiting. It also has the unusual effect of blocking short-term memory. It produces sedation, but at higher doses, it can produce excitement. It may also produce euphoria and is susceptible to abuse. Benzterpene and trihexafenidyl, which are known commercially as cogentin and artan, respectively. They are useful as adjuncts with other anti-Parkinsonian agents to treat Parkinson's disease and other types of Parkinsonian syndromes, including antipsychotic-induced extrapyramidal symptoms. That's all for this lecture. In the upcoming lecture we will discuss the ganglionic blockers and the neuromuscular blockers. You can download the PDF of this lecture from the link down in the description. Subscribe and download Medical Videos application from Google Play Store. Follow us on social media to easily get our newest videos.